Um, so we are in week two of our question series, and, and last week, I just really believe it was a powerful time where God ministered to his church through answering your questions. I challenged you and said this last week, that all of the questions that we are going to look at come from y'all. Um, meaning someone inside this church asked the question and wants to know the answer. And so my prayer is that as you listen to the answer, may you also wrestle with the question. May it challenge you to see that someone else is asking this question and someone else needs to know it. May it push you in to community. Uh, and may you have a stronger desire to see and know the people around you. And so my prayer for this week, here's my challenge and my prayer for all of our uh, people who are sitting in these seats, um, meet someone new today. Would you meet someone new today? And, and listen, don't sit around and go like, oh, well, they didn't come meet me. No, you go meet somebody new today. Step out of your comfort zone. Just walk up and shake someone's hand and meet someone new today. Because I want you to know or I want you to think maybe God sent you here today for that very person to be ministered to you or for you to minister to them. We don't know. And so I would just ask for you to do that. Really press in and stop seeing church as just an hour out of your week, but a true community to where you can be nurtured, strengthened, ministered to, and minister to people. Because I believe if we become a community like that, we'll change the world. And so let me give my disclaimer. I give every single year as we step into our question series. Um, first of all, you ask these questions. And I'm going to try my hardest to answer them to the best of my ability. But with time restraints, I might not fully answer your question the way you want me to. I might reword your question to better minister to the entire church. Um, I'll be putting my answers through scripture. But, you know, you know how we get sometimes when confronted with change, we may not like it. And so here's what I'm going to ask for you to do. If I answer a question that makes you a little bit mad, don't say, I'm out, I'm done with this. Use this as an opportunity to press in. Shoot me an email, uh, schedule a meeting with me, um, and let's grow closer to Jesus together in the midst of your frustration. Let's find that godly rub and strengthen one another as iron sharpens iron, ladies and gentlemen. Um, also, if it's your first time here, please understand this is a unique series that we do uh, once a year. This isn't my normal preaching style. Uh, sit with us through this and then come with expectation next, uh, next month as we step into uh, my normal uh, preaching routine. Um, we're excited for you to be here and glad that you are here. All right, so this is how it goes. Question is going to pop up on the board. We're going to look at it through a biblical lens and then answer it. So question number one is this. How do you forgive someone, whether it's your spouse, family member, friend, coworker, or anyone else, when they repeatedly make the same mistakes? That's a great question. That is a great question, and I believe it hits every single one of us in three ways. Right? Either it's hitting someone right now because you're dealing with this right now. Or it hits you because you just got done dealing with this. Or it's about to hit you and you're about to have to deal with this. Because hurting people hurt people. There, and there's a big difference between saying I'm sorry and actually truly repenting. And time and time again, the person may say, oh, I'm so sorry. But they go right back to their same patterns of life. We've all been there. We've all been the victim of this. And let's be honest, we've all been the perpetrator. Each and every one of us has done this through our lives. And many of you have a villain in your story. Many of you are a villain in someone else's story. Maybe it's an abusive parent. Maybe it was a toxic relationship. Maybe it was an action that only happened to you once, but you keep, keep repeatedly uh, replaying the event over and over and over again in your mind. 
Maybe it's a painful experience that you have kept as a secret. Or maybe it's just that drunk uncle that just ruins Christmas every single year. Regardless of what it is, if you're not careful, those pains become the devil's playground. And he begins to breed bitterness, resentment, rage, and if you're not careful, hatred with inside your heart. Listen to Leviticus. Leviticus 19. I know we don't quote this book often, but man, this is a powerful sentence. Leviticus 19, 17, and 18. He says this, do not nurse hatred in your heart for any of your relatives. Confront people directly so you will not be held guilty for their sin. Do not seek revenge or bear a grudge against your fellow Israelite, but love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. I love how this uh, translation words it. Do not nurse hatred in your heart. I think that's a powerful image, and it reminds me of um, small animals. When I was growing up and I was in school, my mom was a vet tech. She was a nurse for a veterinarian hospital. And every few months, my mom would bring home a small animal. Maybe it was a, a puppy. Maybe it was a kitten. Um, maybe it was a possum. Um, maybe it was a squirrel. Uh, we had a woodpecker for a time, ladies and gentlemen. Um, and uh, I'll tell you this real quick side note. Nothing is cooler than a woodpecker that you release back into the wild and it flies around your house. And every once in a while when you get out, it would make a noise and then you would stop and it would land on your shoulder outside. Oh, could you? Okay, let's go back. Just put yourself in my shoes. I'm in the 11th grade. I bring a girlfriend home for the first time. She gets out of my car. I hear the woodpecker. I say, hold on a second. Just pause really quick. And a woodpecker lands on my shoulder. They think I'm Snow White, ladies and gentlemen. This is amazing. We have all of these. And she, we would, uh, that's not in my notes. Um, every single one of those animals were orphans. And they were too young to care for themselves. They would have died if we didn't nurse them to health. Hear me in this church. Hatred only stays within your heart if you give it space to grow. We used to have socks filled with rice, and we would uh, put them in the microwave and heat them up, and we would place them inside the cages so the, 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 the animal squirrel, whatever, would nestle next to it to get warmth. We would bottle feed. We would wake up throughout the night to check on these animals and to nurse these animals back to health. They survived only because we nursed them. See, hatred, ladies and gentlemen, can only live in a heart that's not filled with forgiveness. If your heart is filled with forgiveness, you have nowhere to nurse hatred. It's something vital for you and I to get. So when it comes to forgiveness, forgiveness is more about your soul than the soul of the offender. Peter challenges Jesus on this. He goes, how many times should I forgive somebody? Seven? And he goes, 70 times seven. And I want you to sit here and think about that. That's almost an uncountable number for a fisherman back in that day who didn't have a fancy calculator on his iPhone. Right? So Jesus was making the point that our forgiveness isn't, uh, isn't outweighed by their sin. See, when we forgive, we show the heart of our Father. See, our sin was not too heavy for Jesus to pay for. Our lives are never too out of control for God to restore. So then how do we forgive someone who keeps repeatedly making the same mistake? And I think the answer is only through the anointing of the Holy Spirit and in the mindset that, uh, that just because they don't change doesn't mean they need to drag you into sin with them. Don't allow their sinfulness to lead you to a life of sinful hatred. I've watched this too many times in people as, as someone else makes a sin or sins against them repeatedly and hatred begins to build. And then those people live rent-free in your mind and in your heart. 
right? Someone cuts you off in traffic and now you're thinking about it for like three days straight, right? And for us as believers, we need to let that stuff go. I have watched healthy people be destroyed over hatred and unforgiveness. Worst of all, I have watched healthy people destroy healthy relationships, not because of the other person, but because of the last person who was unhealthy who hurt them. And so for many of us, it almost becomes this self-fulfilling prophecy where they sit here and go, well, you're just going to leave me because everyone else has left me in my life. And so you're going to leave me as well. And because of that hatred, because of that frustration, because of that other person's wound inflicted in them, they begin to nag, they begin to judge, they begin to assume, they begin to push the person further and further away. And then when that person finally leaves, the individual goes, see, I knew they were going to leave me. Self-fulfilling prophecy, ladies and gentlemen. Ladies and gentlemen, hatred cannot last with a heart that's filled with forgiveness. But it's interesting, I'll switch a little bit and, and challenge our souls. Leviticus tells us that we're not called to be a doormat. I love in this passage, it says, confront people directly. We don't like to do that much anymore. But the Bible calls for us to call, uh, to, to confront people directly because their toxic behavior doesn't have to be your burden to bear. Just because they're, let me say this, just because they're blood doesn't mean they have to be invited to the Christmas party. Right? Why do we give a pass to family members who have toxic behavior that you would never give a pass to anyone else in the world to? I heard a, uh, I heard a pastor word it this way. He says, why do we keep allowing toxic people to ruin our most valuable days? Every year, Uncle Jim gets hammered and ruins Christmas. And we just go, well, that's just Uncle Jim. Why do we allow the most toxic person in our lives ruin some of our most valuable days? We're not doormats, ladies and gentlemen. We confront directly. And so when it comes to people, forgiveness and being a doormat are not the same thing. So I would encourage you, pray about it. Put up boundaries. Ask them to hold to those boundaries. And if they are unwilling to, I would say one of the most godliest things you can do is remove those individuals from your life. I would encourage you to follow Matthew 18 and not become a town gossip. But healthy boundaries are vital. But if the toxic person you believe is your spouse... Here's what I want to walk you through. You need help. You need help. You need professional help. God has brought you together in this, has unified you together in this, and so you need help. You should not live in an abusive relationship, and you should not be a doormat. You need to speak up and confront directly, ladies and gentlemen. And the church is here to help you with that. We have great godly people who want to walk you through those things. If it is your spouse, don't look around. Blink twice. No, I'm just kidding. Um, you need help. Christians are called to be humble, not doormats. Great question. All right, moving on to question number two. Um, do people who have been, uh, do people who have been married more than two or three times have all their spouses with them in heaven? Um, that'd be some interesting ones, right? Your husband passes and you marry his best friend and you both get to heaven? Kind of weird. Um, the, uh, the good thing about this is this is an easy one because someone actually already asked Jesus this question um, and he answered it. The person who asked Jesus this question was actually trying to trick Jesus. That's not what this question was, but the person who asked it back in Matthew um, did it. And Jesus saw through it and he boldly answered it. So I don't really have to answer this question because Jesus is better than mine. Uh, Matthew 22, 23 through 30. Let me just read it. 
The same day, the Sadducee, uh, who say there is no resurrection, came to him asking him, Teacher, Moses said, if a man dies without having children, his brother must marry the widow and father children for his brother. Now there were seven brothers among us. The first one married and died, and since he had no children, he left his wife to his brother. The second one did the same, and the third one all the way down to the seventh. Last of all, the woman died. In the resurrection, therefore, I can hear the, the snooty tone as he's asking this question. Uh, in the resurrection, therefore, whose wife of the seven will she be? And then, uh, for they have all married her. Jesus answered them, you are deceived because you do not know the scriptures. If anyone denies, let me just say, anyone denies the resurrection, they are deceived and they don't know the scriptures, ladies and gentlemen. Our God is coming back for his bride one day and we will be resurrected, ladies and gentlemen. Um, uh, know the scriptures or the power of God. For the resurrection, they neither marry nor are given into marriage, but are like the angels in heaven. So in heaven, we will not be married to our earthly spouses. The relationship of marriage is beautiful and divinely ordained, but it is entirely earthly, and it's in a temporal institution. Exclu Listen to this. Exclusive relationships will not be in heaven because we will all be bound to one another in Christ. So no spouses in heaven. Um, please don't allow your spouse to see you cheer for that uh, in, in any way, shape, or form. Um, all right, good question. Moving on to the next one. Um, uh, this is another question about heaven. Uh, really, actually, really good one that made me do a lot of research and think. Um, do our loved ones see us, or any Christian or, uh, in heaven, see us here on earth after they have passed? Um, First of all, I want to ask this uh, to the person who asked this question or to anyone pondering this question. If you, are, if you are asking this question or pondering this question, looking for some form of comfort from it, please hear the heart of your pastor. I am so sorry you're grieving. I am so sorry that a loved one has passed and it grieves your heart. Please know that we understand. Scripture tells for us and calls for us to have a time to grieve. Um, I would encourage you, do not grieve alone. We love you. Press in. Allow us to love you and allow you to grieve because we believe grieving is necessary regardless of how long ago the person passed. You don't get a pass on that. You don't get to sit here and go, well, I don't feel like I should grieve my dad anymore because he died 20 years ago. No, you don't. You get a pass on that. If you feel you need to grieve, press in. Let us grieve with you on this. Um, I will say my answer may or not bring you comfort, but please know this. True comfort only comes from the unconditional love of Christ. It is only in him that you will find true peace. But let's answer this question. As I was doing research on this question, someone actually asked uh, John Piper this question, um, and he answered it in 2017 on his podcast, uh, asked Pastor John, you can listen to the full thing. Um, it's actually nine minutes. Um, I do not have that type of time uh, to unpack that. He gives five points to his answer. I just want to unpack three very fast um, because I think he answers it beautifully. First thing he states is this, that we as believers just don't know for sure. At least we don't know what extent they may be allowed to see and know, that, uh, know what all is happening on earth. There is at least one passage in scripture that some scholars would have interpreted or may interpret it that way, uh, but it's not entirely clear. That uh, passage of scripture is Hebrews 12.1. Um, we will uh, look at it in a second. But the entire Bible just doesn't address this topic clearly. Why? Because the main goal of the Bible isn't what we see when we get to heaven, but how to receive eternal life 
through the gospel and actually go to heaven, ladies and gentlemen. Second thing he says this, if they do see, if God grants saints in heaven to see the suffering, the misery, as well as the good here on earth, we can be sure that they see it not with their old imperfect eyes. And they don't understand it in their old and unimperfect, unimperfect minds. And they don't assess it with their old imperfect hearts. Rather, because the Bible says so, they have been perfected in heaven. Hebrews 12.23 they will see and understand and assess all things perfectly in a spiritual way that takes into account everything they need to know in order to make sense of it. What does this mean? There is not a mother in heaven looking down on her child in a hospital bed, weeping and grieving because their child's in a hospital bed. If they do see and God gives them the clarity to see, they will, the mother would be in heaven rejoicing for their child in a hospital bed. Not because they're sick, but because they know full well and perfectly well how our good and holy God is going to use this for his glory. And so instead of weeping, the mother would be in heaven cheering, praising our God because we know God will redeem all all things in Christ. We don't understand that statement here on earth, but we will fully understand it in heaven, ladies and gentlemen. And then the third thing, he unpacks Hebrew chapter 12, verse 1. Listen to the verse. It says, Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. He goes on to say, now, that word for witness can be translated as testimony. We see it translated as testimony three other times in the previous chapter, chapter 11. That's the faith chapter, if you've ever read it. But John Piper says this, and this is the point that I want you to get. He says, I am inclined to think that it does mean they are watching, partly because of the picture of the race. It is as though the saints finish their marathon at death and then they come around and stand on the side of the racetrack and watch us. And we are supposed to take heart from that because in essence, what they would be saying is, um, hang in there, trust in God. You can do this. We have made it. You can make it too. Pastor Nate, what do you believe? Frankly, I don't have an opinion on this subject. Because in my mind, it doesn't matter. My goal here on earth is to glorify God with my entire life. Does knowing that Billy Graham or the Apostle Paul is looking down on me give me comfort? Maybe. But really... I find encouragement and strength, not from them looking down on me in heaven, but from the life that they lived. If they can live a godly life, a man who persecuted the church and threw Christians in jail and watched Christians die, who held coats so that they kill, could kill Christians more, and then turns around and becomes the Apostle Paul and plants churches and, and literally carries on the gospel to his death. That's what encourages my soul. That's what encourages my heart. And in the end, ultimately, my source of strength comes from the gospel, not from mere men or women anyways. I'm dumbfounded by the amount of people who get offended by a Christian and then walk away from the church altogether. That's not what this is about. The, the, the race isn't about you or I. The race is, as the rest of the verse says, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, ladies and gentlemen. 
So in the end of the day, if my relatives are watching me or Billy Graham or anyone is watching me, that is no point to me. Is Jesus watching me? And is Jesus encouraging me? And is Jesus leading me on? That's where I find comfort. That's where I find strength. Ooh, I don't know where I, that, that was not in my notes. But at the end of the day, it's a great question. I never thought about it. Thank you so much for asking it. But again, I think we should probably be more concerned with the loved ones that are still here and alive if they're going to heaven than the ones who are already there. Next question. Um, this is actually a two-parter, and it's actually my last one. So um, we are oh, doing good. All right, uh, two-part question about baptisms. So the first question is this. Why is my baptism invalid if it was spontaneous? And is everything, uh, and is everything that changed in my life afterwards now invalid? Am I not saved? Great question about baptism and spontaneous baptism. Second question. Why do some denominations baptize babies while others baptize individuals who have accepted Christ and understand its meaning. And so these two questions focus on the meaning of baptism and, and the way baptism should be carried out. Um, I believe this passage or these questions should be answered in two parts. One, theological, and then two, church practice. Uh, first, let me address the theological question. Uh, it wasn't specifically asked in here, but we must answer it, and our catechism answered it. Does baptism save you? No. No, it does not. Repenting and believing the gospel is what saved you. Let me simply define it. It is the justification of sinners to God through the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. Romans 3, 23 through 24 states, For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, but they are justified freely by the, uh, His grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Baptism plays no part in the salvational aspect of Christianity. Let me make that clear. Though it does play a part in our sanctification. Baptism is an outward expression of a confidential change with inside a person. There are churches inside our city who teach baptism does save you. This is a heresy called baptismal regeneration. Um, I am not... Um, I'm not going to publicly name these churches, but if you are a covenantal member um, who, who wants to know these churches, you can ask me in private and I will share those with you, but I will not publicly name those here. Um, um, but this is a works-based salvation and not the true gospel. But what about spontaneous baptism? The person asks. Well, what if I just spontaneously got baptized? I would say this. I believe uh, this is more about church practice than theology. We here at The Rock are concerned that there, those types of services, spontaneous baptism services, have the temptation to man emotionally manipulate someone into baptism. I never want someone to believe they are saved when they're truly not. So to answer your question about your own salvation, are you saved because you were spontaneously baptized? I, I guess I have to ask you a question first. When did you repent and call on Christ as Lord? Was it before or after the baptism service? If it was after, I would say, praise God. God used that service as an aspect, as a part, to draw you unto salvation, to illuminate your heart to the gospel. I would say the signs that everything are changing in your life is a good sign that the gospel has saved you. I was talking to my rock group about this, and I think, I think we get hung up when we look at scripture, and we get hung up on only one person's style of salvation. We all look at just Paul's salvation. Paul was going this way, then he had a moment with Jesus, and then he completely changed and went this way. And so I think we all think we need to have that type of salvation experience. But the reality is there are people who have that experience. My wife had that experience. She was living one way. She met Jesus and completely changed. 
but there are people like me who have a more Peter mindset where they make a, a profession of faith and they follow Jesus and then screw up and drop the ball and then make another and they screw up and drop the ball and they make and it is this roller coaster of just growing more and more in Jesus over their lives having called on him and followed him but are constantly trying to learn how to grow and then there are Timothy's Paul literally goes, I hope you hold on to the faith that your mother and your grandmother taught you. And those are the people who just are good. Where you just kind of, they're kind of like, well, I don't have a past. I didn't do drugs. I didn't do all this. And I didn't do, I don't even have a tattoo. I'm all like, you know, they're just all of those things. They just kind of grew up in church. And at a young age, they gave their lives to Christ. And then they stayed in the church and they just kept growing in Christ. And, and those individual people sometimes get discouraged and goes, man, I don't have that type of testimony. Praise God you don't have that type of testimony. Praise God that our God saved your soul. And so I, I would just challenge you in the midst of all of this. If you have never repented and called on Jesus as Lord, and then, you, then I would just say you just got wet. You were not saved. Please repent today because today is the day of salvation. Speak to someone after the service. We would love to talk to you. But to conclude this service, what about the second question? When should someone be baptized before or after their recognition of salvation? I'll word it that way. Because there are entire Christian groups that believe God chooses who will be saved before they are born. And then their salvation experience is when they realize that they are aware that they are chosen. And so baptism as an infant is a sign of God being faithful to his covenant. And there are godly people who believe this and their church practices display that. They may not come out publicly and admit it, but baptism as an infant is a sign of a God uh, being faithful to his covenant. Which if that's the reason, then I would not condemn that or call that as heresy. I would lovingly respect the fellow believer's open-handed church practice. Though we don't operate that way here because we don't see that. So for the sake of time, let me be really quick. Our church personally believes baptism happens after salvation experience. We see this in Acts chapter 8. Because it is a sign that God has saved and redeemed your life. We are baptized into the death of Christ and raised into his new life. Last week, we did baptism, and it was beautiful to watch the testimony of a father who has given his life to Christ and then is baptized, raised to new life, a new man in Christ, and then he gets out of the baptismal waters to turn around and then baptize his wife who has given her life to Christ and changed. And then for her to step out and to watch their teenager get baptized and raised to, to, new, to new life as they are believing and praying for their two sons down the road. It is beautiful to watch two young children who are just growing up in the church and just express a, a desire for the Lord at such a young age. It is wonderful for us to watch that and encourage our souls as their parents instill in them this love for the Lord. I have so much I can say about this, but I do not have the time. I just want to end with this. It is Jesus who saves. It is Jesus who saves. It doesn't have to be in a church service. You don't have to walk an aisle. It is just understanding that you are a sinner in need of a holy Savior and that Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection covers your sins, ladies and gentlemen. And if you have never called on the name of the Lord, if you have never had a time in your life where you just humbly laid your life down, 
down for Christ. Maybe you're a Saul who is running away from the Lord and today is the day you become a Paul. Maybe you're a Peter who Jesus just says, today, follow me. And you're going to make mistakes, but you need to follow. Or maybe today you're a Timothy. And you're younger. Your parents are instilling the gospel in your heart. And today, God is illuminating it. I don't know what it is. But today is the day for salvation.